I'm Sebastien Saint-Francois. Shock and grief in one Toronto neighbourhood tonight after the bodies of six hostages were recovered by the Israeli army in Gaza. Vigils are taking place worldwide, including right here in North York. They were murdered. These six beautiful souls were murdered while in captivity in Gaza. And tonight, as a community, we come together and mourn them with their families. Four men and two women died. Four for more, yes, on who the hostages were and the reaction to their deaths. Here's Katie Nicholson. They jammed into the streets of Tel Aviv and Jerusalem, tens of thousands. And as darkness fell, tempers flared. Some clashed with police. That fury directed largely at their own government after a devastating discovery deep underground in Gaza. The bodies of six hostages recovered by the Israeli forces in the tunnels under Rafah, ranging in age from 23 to 40, five taken from a music festival, one from a kibbutz. Israel says they had been recently executed, shot at close range. It was a cowardless, a coward act to murder them the way they did. Torontonian Mayan Shavit's cousin Carmel Gatt is among the dead. I am devastated. The family is devastated. We are broken. But we must not forget that there is 101 hostages, that there's some, the majority, are still alive, but not for long. Those with family still unaccounted for, also unnerved and furious. They should have c come back alive. A deal should have been struck a long time ago. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has been accused of dragging his feet on a ceasefire to preserve political power. Despite demands he addressed the nation, he instead put out a pre-recorded video statement vowing to continue the fight and hold those who killed the hostages accountable. That, as the opposition leader condemned him. Netanyahu and the death cabinet decided not to rescue the hostages, said Yair Lapid. That blood is on their hands. This marks the 11th month of war. Officials believe more than 100 hostages are still inside Gaza, two-thirds of whom are thought to be alive. In that time, more than 40,000 Palestinians also died, according to Gaza's health ministry. The Biden administration has been pushing hard for a deal between Israel and Hamas. The latest round of talks have so far failed. But Monday may bring renewed pressure on Israel, its largest union calling for a general strike to bring the country to a standstill and try to force its government to strike a deal and deliver the rest of the hostages safely home. Katie Nicholson, CBC News, Washington. Turning back closer to home, where pet owners in Toronto's Riverdale community gathered last night for a vigil. They were honoring the dead animals that were allegedly armed by 18 living in the neighborhood. The community experienced a really upsetting event, and it was important to me to get involved in a fruitful and compassionate way. And uh, the intention tonight was to spread awareness with the intention of increasing safety in the neighborhood. In the end, all we really have is our community and we can together stand for whatever we're going to go through. Um, yeah, it's, just, it's a crazy situation. Police arrested and charged a 16-year-old boy in an animal cruelty investigation after he had allegedly killed a cat and several wild animals, including a raccoon. Investigators say they believe there are witnesses to the injuring and killing of the animals, and they are urging those witnesses to come forward. Toronto Police also on another case, that one of a man who was killed in an alley early this morning. The shooting happened just north of Eglinton near the Allen Expressway. From the scene, Lane Harrison has the details. 
Police found an injured man in this alleyway around 620 Sunday morning after officers were called to the location for reports of a shooting. The victim, a man in his 30s, was rushed to hospital with gunshot wounds where police say he was pronounced dead. Forensic officers have been collecting evidence here all afternoon just north of Eglinton between Marley Avenue and Times Road. Now police say that this is the location of an after hours club which was operating at the time of the shooting. The connection or relation to that is being investigated. However, at this time, there is no direct connection that we are aware of. Police have identified the victim as 37 year old Tristan McNally from Brampton. So far, police have released no information about a suspect. The shooting happened near a busy area filled with businesses. One woman, whose shop is just across from the alley, hopes it's just a one off incident. It makes you a little bit nervous because we haven't had this. Uh, kind of stuff around this area for a while so and then suddenly um, you open your, your business and you see all this police. The alleyway is filled with apartments above the shops and restaurants. The shooting has left some residents on edge. It's uh, really scared the hell out of me. They've been partying around all weekend and it's long weekend I think it's very sad for the family who who has been shot. It's a labor day you know everyone wants to be happy with their families. But uh, that's sad what's been happening here. The incident is yet another in what has been a concerning year for gun crime in Toronto. In 2024 so far, police have logged more shootings and firearm discharges than in each of the previous four years. As police look to piece together what happened here and a picture of who did it, they're asking anyone with information or security camera footage to come forward to investigators. Lane Harrison, CBC News, Toronto. Turning now to Brampton, where Peel police have arrested a man in connection to a homicide. Police initially responded to a home on Milestone Drive on Friday morning for reports of a suspicious vehicle. When they arrived, they found a man inside a car. The man had been shot and was later pronounced dead at the scene. In a news release published today, police say they have arrested a man in his 20s in connection with the shooting. Investigators believe that the incident was isolated and they are asking anyone with information to contact them. Taking you to Georgina now, where the Aurora OPP detachment is investigating a three-vehicle crash on Highway 48. A passenger was transported by Orange Air Ambulance and was initially in critical condition. Good news, though, that person's injuries have since been downgraded to serious but non-life-threatening. Four others were taken to hospital with minor injuries. Highway 48 between Old Homestead and Ellsview was closed for several hours while police investigated. The OPP reminding drivers on this long weekend to follow the rules of the road. They're in the midst of a long weekend traffic initiative across the province. OPP says officers are targeting speeding, seatbelt violations, distracted driving and impaired driving. In Ottawa, OPP say they charge an individual with, listen to this, distracted driving for filming a collision scene while driving. There's a live look at Toronto skyline, 16 degrees downtown right now. Sophia Cambalia joins us now from the Weather Network for a first look at the forecast. Sophia, there's one day left in this long weekend, so how's the weather shaping up? Thank you. Yes, the weekend a lot different than how it began. A lot more fall vibes. Pumpkin spice lattes and sweaters will be seen as you're packing up the cottage and the campsite to head home. In fact, we may have seen the end of some of the best comp camping and cottaging so far this season. Some really nice overnight sleeping conditions, though. Over the next few nights, you can have the windows open uh, and a big thick blanket on. In fact, you'll notice a change in the air over the next few days. Less bugs, maybe the leaves starting to change, and certainly more sweaters and less shorts as the fall like vibes will really be turned on clear skies into your overnight period and plenty of sunshine for your daytime highs for the next few days. We've got high pressure moving in from Michigan. What this means is cool Arctic air is circling in a clockwise direction. Uh, we will definitely have some cooler overnight lows and daytime highs. Picture the lid on a pot on the stove removed and all that heat can escape. And that's exactly what we have going on for Labor Day Monday. And to start off your back to school week as temperatures will be anywhere from three to five degrees below seasonal. Have a look at Monday right across the board, barely cracking the 20s. And 
and look, the temperature and the feels like are dead on even. That means there's no humidity right across the province as well. For Tuesday, back to school, plenty of sunshine. We are warming up a little closer to seasonal with those low 20s. In fact, it's going to be a really pleasant day right across the board for Tuesday. Back to school as the kids return. Nice afternoon conditions, but really dressed with those sweaters and jackets. They will be needed for chilly morning highs, feeling into the high single digits. Coming up on the Long Range, we'll talk a little bit more about how the warmth spreads to the end of the week, and so does the chance for active weather. Sebastian. Thank you, Sophia. Now, when international students go back to school this month, they might be making a bit less money than they were before because a new federal rule says they will only be allowed to work 24 hours per week starting this September. Some advocates are calling it unfair, while others say the change is necessary. Brittany Billett has the details. Working at 40 hours gave me more financial stability and I don't have that anymore. This Toronto international student says she's already cut down on expenses to prepare for the new rules around work hours for students. So I moved in with like two of my friends um, to an apartment which is cheaper so that I can save up on some rent and also like cut down on groceries and eating out. During the pandemic, the federal government temporarily waived the 20-hour cap on work hours to ease labor shortages. Students jumped at the opportunity to make a bit more money. But with things inching back to normal in April, the feds announced that it would be reintroducing a work hours cap for international students. Now they can only work 24 hours per week. We need to support international students and make sure they are set up for success. Um, and that they're here properly studying. This economic professor agrees. He thinks students need a bit more help focusing on their studies. What student is not gonna choose money over studying? And so it's just gonna make uh, the, the education at post-secondary level uh, a little weaker. It devalues the uh, education a little bit. Some students who are used to working under the previous cap are welcoming the move as well. People say that they can't manage, they all want to work, not focus on the studies, That that's not fair. They should focus on their studies too. According to the federal government, every year international students contribute tens of billions of dollars into the Canadian economy. But advocates say the new rules and restrictions are both unwelcoming and unfair. Not every student can afford to go to school without that extra income. In any any uh, structure, you have to have an equ equity framework. This return to a work hours cap is being introduced on top of new requirements mandated by the federal government, like doubling how much money students need to have before coming here and a new cap on how many applications the government would accept. I feel like it's pretty volatile here and you can't really like uh, trust what's going to happen next because the rules keep changing every month. And for those like Fatsa Fekir, the new work hour cap will just make life as a student in an era of inflation that much harder. I feel like if I have that financial support, um, then I'm able to study better because I'm not stressing about how I'm going to pay the rent or how am I going to like survive, get food tomorrow. Like many others living in Canada, she says she'll just have to make do as best as she can. Brittany Ballet, CBC News, Toronto. Welcome back. Sad news in the journalism world tonight. Stevie Cameron, a Canadian journalist, author and philanthropist, has died. Cameron was born in Belleville, Ontario. She worked at many news outlets during her career, including the Globe and Mail and the Toronto Star. She also hosted CBC's The Fifth Estate in the early 90s. Cameron wrote several books whose subjects ranged from serial killer Robert Picton to the scandals of former Prime Minister Brian Mulroney. Her philanthropic efforts focused on helping the homeless and others in material need. In 2014, she was appointed to the Order of Canada for her contributions. Cameron's family told CBC News that she died in her home in Toronto on Saturday. She was 80 years old. The shock and bewilderment remain in an Alberta First Nation after Friday's fatal shooting of a teenager by RCMP officers. Sam Sampson has the latest. Roses and sage dedicated to the teen who was shot and killed by police nearby. It's scary. <laughs> These are scary times. If a kid's going to get shot, it scares me too now. RCMP say a 15-year-old boy called 911 just after midnight Friday, reporting that someone was trying to kill him. About an hour later, officers found the boy near this intersection. Officers say they took several weapons from him. After that, RCMP say a confrontation happened. Two officers fired their guns. The teen was shot. 
RCMP say they gave him first aid and called for an ambulance, but he died in hospital. The death, shocking for the surrounding community. And why wasn't like somebody to come speak to him instead of just pointing a gun and shooting at him like a 15 year old? It's hard losing someone, especially that young, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, I can't imagine how the parents feel, the grandparents, right? The teenager was from Samson Cree Nation, a Treaty 6 community not too far from the shooting. I have a young son that's 15 as well, and I, I don't know, it really hits home. Treaty 6 Grand Chief Cody Thomas says he has so many unanswered questions. Peacefully, weapons were taken away, and I just don't understand how the lethal force was the last option, or was the, was the only option. RCMP won't answer any more questions, saying Alberta's police watchdog, known as ACERT, has taken over. ACERT has not responded to our request for comment. ACERT will send in both uh, uh, witness investigators and likely forensic investigators. Patrick Watson studies police oversight bodies in Canada. He says part of the process may involve interviewing the officers who were present. They can volunteer to, to give statements. They can volunteer to surrender their notes to ACERT but they cannot be mandated to do that. The chief of Samson Cree Nation told me over the phone he plans to meet with the family Sunday night to help decide how they want to share their story. Sam Sampson, CBC News, Samson Cree Nation, Alberta. A group of four people found near a beach in BC were found suffering from apparent drug poisonings. Two of them have died. As Yvette Brand reports, it's a grim reminder of the crisis gripping this country. Friday, at this tranquil beach on Vancouver Island, a sunrise swimmer found a tragedy unfolding. Four people sprawled near a truck, overdosing. Uh, this neighbor was shocked. Majorly, yeah. Yeah, it was, uh, yeah, because nothing ever happens down here. Two women died, two men left in critical condition, all in their 30s and 40s. We don't tend to see this many people overdosing simultaneously, and it's, uh, it's, it's, it's rare, but it, it is sort of a, a nightmare scenario about what can happen, you know, in, in, in a worst case. Officials say it's a stark reminder, never use drugs alone, always with somebody sober. More than six people die every day on average in BC from toxic drugs. Many of the people are, the numbers are just faceless to people, so we try and bring their faces out here and say, look, this is really who we're losing. And, um, you know, we shouldn't be. It's wrong. Nationally, the death toll has surpassed 44,000 Canadians in eight years. Now, supervised consumption sites where users can test their drugs and have staff on hand to stop an overdose are increasingly under fire. And I was just wondering how you would feel if I stuck one of these beside your house. You wouldn't like it. Last month, Ontario banned supervised consumption sites near schools and daycares, effectively closing 10 of its 17 facilities. That province says it's focused instead on treatment. Alberta, too, which has built multi-million dollar recovery centres. We're losing lives. We're losing a lot of, of uh, potential for Canada. You're still breathing, brother. This man, Harold Melbourne, recovered after 15 years of using. Good morning. And now helps others struggling to stop these using. Are, uh, he wants to see BC focus more on recovery, uh, too. Many times we have somebody coming in here, they want to clean up, but we can't hold on to them because there's no beds available. Hey, guys. He, one welcome. of many demanding welcome, more support welcome. to help save lives yeah. across Canada. Yvette Brand, CBC News, Vancouver. Welcome back. The new school year is right around the corner and this community program is giving back now in its seventh year, Confident Cuts, that's the name of the program, brought 100 free haircuts and school supplies just in time for classes to start. Uh, we're running a back to school event to help make sure kids get haircuts, braid ups, back to school supplies, backpacks and free shoes to go back to school feeling as confident as possible. We, we, we choose to organize this because we know how important it is to go back to school feeling good about ourselves. And we know how long the school year is and all the variables that it comes with and, and especially like being in situations or coming from communities where like there might not be all the resources needed to support people. Um, we need to be equipped to support ourselves. So if we can start the year with a smile then we, can really, we really can't ask for much more. Honestly like at the end of the day if we can put a smile on one kid's face, I know it sounds cliche, then we've done our job, but you look around and we got hundreds of kids and 
if not when you put it all together thousands of, thousands of people smiling at the end of the day so I'm just thankful for all the support that we have to make this to make this day happen the barbers they're just happy that they get to give back in the, in their way you know with their superpower cutting hair is an art in itself and with the kids I mean look at their smiles when they get out the chair look at them like looking at themselves in the mirror look at how they feel they say it I can't say it for them but like how you feel when you get a haircut um, it's, it's an indescribable feeling. You're looking live at Ottawa Skyline. It's 16 degrees right now in the capital. Let's bring back Sophia with a look at our long-range forecast. Sophia, how are things looking for the first week back to school? Well, it's going to be a pleasant back to school week, Sebastian, after this cool start uh, and a cool Labor Day Monday to finish off this last hurrah of summer. You're barely cracking the 20s for Monday. Remember the fall like vibes leading into really a lovely first day back to school on Tuesday for all the kiddos. A little bit on the cooler side, even with those sunny daytime highs. Look at some of those morning conditions feeling into the high single digits and low double digits. You're certainly going to need your fall wardrobe and a sweater or a jacket for the walk to school or even the bus stop all across the board. Similar conditions for back to school Tuesday, those low 20s. We are adding a couple degrees, but keeping all the sunshine for midweek Wednesday as we are heading closer to seasonal. In fact, for the majority of this upcoming work week, it's a really nice stable atmosphere clocking in a ton of lovely sunshine hours before things fall off the end of the cliff as we head into the weekend. Have a look at Thursday, though, before we talk about the active weather. Maybe the best day of the work week, seasonal conditions and even a little bit of humidity. Here's what's going to be going on for the majority of this week. A ridge will look to assert itself with warmth and high pressure, but come Thursday and Friday, a trough will end up winning the battle and creating almost a conveyor belt of storms, an area of low pressure that could form above us on Friday and that's exactly what is going to happen because waiting in the wings for Friday are two areas of atmospheric development. Gulf moisture to the south and a cool arctic cold front to the north. Those two air masses will do battle come Friday and depending on which one wins out that's the kind of stormy weather we will have throughout Friday afternoon and evening and even Saturday morning depending on how far east you go in the province. Enjoy the nice stable work week. We head into a bit of active weather as we head into this next weekend. And remember, cool, clear overnight condition, a little bit breezy, but mainly a seasonal and lovely week. Good luck. Back to school, everyone. Thank you, Sophia.